If you are not properly analyzing the music of your favorite artists, you are massively missing out. This is one of the biggest opportunities to become a better music producer and in this video I'm going to show you my favorite way of analyzing reference tracks, how to apply critical listening and also a couple of free tools that you can use to become a better music producer by analyzing your reference tracks. You're going to learn exactly what to listen for, which dimensions you need to focus on when analyzing a reference track, and also how to read all these tools that I'm going to share with you. Make sure to stick around to the end of this video because I'm also going to reveal my favorite referencing plugin. It's not a free one, but still I think it's worth it. And by the way, if you don't know who I am, my name is Philip from Pick Yourself. I'm a mixing and mastering engineer. I do this full time, specializing in electronic music. So if you want to see more of these videos where I analyze tracks, where I talk about how to use certain tools, make sure to subscribe because I'm going to put out regular videos every single week. So without further ado, let's jump into our DAW and take a look at what we have there. So in this session, you can see two different tracks. I just want to compare them a little bit, show you what's different about them, how they are produced differently, and what we can see inside of those tracks using our analysis tools. The track on top here is by an artist called Sebastian Hoffmann. He's a techno artist here from Berlin, super talented guy. He now also is my studio assistant, so it was relatively easy to get the permission to use this track here for this video. And I've mastered this track, but he produced and mixed it. And the track on the bottom is a track of my own. It's a little bit different in terms of style. It's also techno, but a tiny different sub-niche within techno. Obviously, I produced, mixed and mastered this piece. It's not out yet, but it will come out soon, so make sure to watch out for that as well. And yeah, we're just going to dive in and compare those two and see what we can find out using our analysis tools. So first of all, I want to give you an idea of what the music actually is about. And I will just jump through some sections here on the top track and then on the bottom one. And we'll leave it in solo here so you can listen just one track at a time, of course. Let's start with Sebastian Hoffmann's track. <laughs> And now the Kupilko track, which is mine. So you can immediately hear that there's a huge difference between the tracks. They're both techno, but uh, Sebastian's track is a little bit faster. Mine is a little bit slower. Both have this hypnotic vibe, I would say, but um, Sebastian's track is much more straightforward, I would say, a little bit more, um, yeah, in your face sounding, whereas the track that I created is like a little bit more spacious, a little bit more atmospheric. But both of them, I think, display a really nice emotion. Um, you can check them out in real life quite soon. So I think Sebastian's track is already out for a while. Mine will be out uh, quite soon. And now let's look at the different plugins that we're using for analysis. So first of all, we want to look at the frequencies. How are the frequencies in the tracks as a whole, but also from the different instruments distributed across both tracks. So I'm going to use the Voxango Span. It's a free analyzer tool. It's my favorite free analyzer. I love it. It's super precise. It's super stable. I've never had any problems with it. And it's completely free, so why not get it? Now, these days, a lot of EQ plugins also have a built-in analyzer. Some of them are better, some of them are not so good, but the ones that I personally like are the implementations in the FabFilter Pro Q3, which is a super fantastic equalizer plugin that a lot of people are using. And the one that I currently use, which is relatively similar, is the Kirchhoff EQ. It's almost like a copy of the FabFilter Pro Q3 with a little bit more functionality still. This also has a really good analyzer built in. So if you prefer to look at these tools because they're more familiar, that's also completely fine. So let's take a look, flip between the two songs and just see what's happening here in the frequency domain. So first of all, Sebastian Hoffmann's track. <laughs> Okay, that's really interesting. You can see some subtle shifts in the frequency spectrum when I flip back and forth between those two tracks. Now, the question is, what do you now do with this information? How do you actually get some valuable info out of this? Let me show you how. So with these analysis tools and also with your critical listening skills, you can always take on two different perspectives when listening to a track. The first perspective is the mixing perspective, which means you focus on individual elements within that production. Let's say the kick drum, the drum tops or the lead section. And the other perspective that you can use is the mastering perspective. The mastering perspective means 
you try to look at the track as a whole, look at the frequency distribution of everything compared to another track, for example. So this gives you a little bit of distance, whereas the mixing perspective is more like a zoom in. I'm going to show you how to listen to both of those things. Let's start with the mastering perspective. And instead of listening to it and looking at this graph here, that shows you all the different uh, resonances. By the way, this is a ring modulation resonance. This is relatively, um, it looks sharp, but it's actually part of the composition and quite intentional. Instead of looking at this with all the different resonances, you can go to a different setting here, which is called stereo mastering. And this gives you a smooth out representation of the frequency content. This is like very good for analyzing the overall frequency distribution from a mastering perspective. Now I'll switch to the other song. And you can immediately see how this changes a little bit. So it's like almost a little tilt happening. You can see the low end decreases a little bit. The high mids are building up and some of the high end is also coming in. It's very interesting and go back to the other one. Can you see how this is completely like a different tilt. So what this tells us is that for both productions, um, the goal was slightly different. The tracks were orientated towards a different end of the frequency spectrum. The one that I created that we're listening to right now is a little bit more round sounding, a little bit more even, a little bit more bass heavy even. Whereas the other one by Sebastian, this one is a little bit sharper, a little bit more aggressive and yeah, a little bit brighter sounding, not as round in the low end. So this is what this mastering setting tells us. It's really interesting to look at this. Now let's talk about the mixing perspective. So for the mixing perspective, we're going to switch back here to our default setting and we're going to compare these two again. And now this time I wanted to try to identify different parts of the song, different elements. is you can listen to the kick drum and try to identify the different parts here. So you can do this by hitting the control button and left click, which then lets you kind of sweep through this frequency spectrum. And you can change um, the width, the Q width of like, the sharpness of this curve with the mouse wheel. So for example, you can identify like the sub frequencies, still belong to the kick drum and also the rumble. Then kick punch is around here. Then let's look for the kick click, a little bit here. But even a little bit here. And this is how you can go through all the different frequencies. Now let's compare this with the other track. It's a much smoother low end here. Kick drum is quite deep, not as much sub rumble happening from the bass. Yeah, very similar here is a little bit of the punch of the kick drum. A bit of click here. And like a little bit of the top click here. So you get the idea, you can kind of identify the different aspects of specific instruments. So for the leads, for example, it would look different. Um, for the percussions it would also look different, but you can really zoom in and identify where things are actually um, connected. And what is really interesting is that a lot of producers, when they think about mixing, they think about perfectly finding the sweet spots of all the different frequencies for all the different elements and trying to space them out as much as possible. But when you listen to these types of productions, the different elements just sound really unnatural and not in a beautiful way, not in an interesting way, but actually in a quite ugly way because things are not connected. And I find mixes and productions much more charming when the elements are actually fused together in a really organic way. And you will find different aspects of all the different elements in very different parts of the frequency spectrum. So for example, if I create a clap, I don't want the clap to just happen on the very top end of the frequency spectrum to make space for the kick and whatever and uh, cut out everything. Now I actually want the clap to have like a little bit of a punch that is really close to where the 
um, punch of the kick drum is actually happening. So somewhere between the 120 to 200 hertz region, or sometimes even 300. So it's really nice to have different elements of different instruments happening in very different parts of the frequency spectrum. And this type of analysis actually gives you this information. Let's now talk about our second tool here, and this is the Flux Stereo Tool. It's also completely free, and what this does is it tells you something about the phase relationship between the left and the right channel, and it also tells you about the width of um, the whole thing. You can also use this creatively to make stuff wider or more narrow, or pan certain elements, flip the phase in certain channels. We're going to use this just to analyze the stereo width of all the elements, how this is distributed in the panorama, and the phrase relationship. So let's listen to the music. So first of all, my track. So what you see here, this is quite a normal distribution here. This is almost looking like a spider web. I think I talked about this also in a, in a different recent video. I was talking about how to make synths wider. Hopefully there's a card somewhere here linking to that video. And um, yeah, this here tells you whether left and right channel are in phase or out of phase. So it should theoretically be possible to flip this around. Yeah, so if I change the phase on the left channel, for example, both are now phased against each other, which is sounding super weird. And you can see this here is below the zero line. So um, definitely out of phase sounds horrible. Now back to normal. That's a really healthy distribution. Let's listen to the other track. So this is even more mono sounding. You can critically listen to this and just identify, okay, all the elements are spaced a bit more central, but also here you can clearly see it. It's less of a spider web. It's almost like a straight line. If you flip the face, same thing. It's just flipped around here and it also gets out of phase. So what does this tell us? Looking at those different stereo width perspectives, it tells us how things were distributed in a stereo spectrum. So in my production, I actually used a little bit more of the stereo panorama. Yeah, so I distributed things a little bit more in the spatial spectrum, whereas Sebastian in his track actually was a little bit more centered. So very club oriented, I would say, but obviously both of them work in mono. So if I sum both of these to mono, they would still work just as well. I just out of taste, like a little bit more width, which is also an artistic choice because his track is really straightforward. It's like really in your face. Whereas mine is like a tiny bit more atmospheric, a little bit more out there. And so I think this was like a conscious artistic choice and it makes total sense in both cases. But it's really helpful for you if you analyze your track compared to reference tracks. So the last tool that we are going to use is the Ulean loudness meter. It's also completely free. There's also a pro version, but in my opinion, the free version is fantastic. It tells you a lot of uh, good things already. And you can use this to get an idea of the perceived loudness of the music. Now, what does perceived loudness mean? It's really important to not confuse perceived loudness with level. So level is like an absolute um, term of like, this is how loud the thing is in full scale. So DBFS is the, for example, the true peak level is like a level indicator, whereas LUFS, loudness units, full scale, this has very different components that go into this. So it's like the peak level, yes, but also RMS uh, detection and also a, I would say a frequency distribution slash psychoacoustic component of how we as humans perceive music to be loud. So really complicated of all the parameters that flow into this, what this in the end means is this gives you an idea of how loud people will perceive that music and also what streaming services like Spotify, for example, are going to do with your music because they all use a normalization feature. Uh, currently it's set to minus 14 LUFS and they will just bring every track down to that LUFS reading. Now, what does that mean for you? Contrary to some of the widespread misinformation out there, you don't have to mix or master your music to the minus 14 LUFS standard. This is absolutely not important. My recommendation, and it's the same recommendation by all like professional mastering engineers, is to just go for the level that just is right for the music. A certain density of the material sounds good for certain tracks and for other tracks it doesn't work at all and they need to be more dynamic. So it's all fine, but you can be sure that everything is then in the end going to be normalized down to minus 14 LUFS. And if you have found the right density for your music, it will still 
feel the same way compared uh, to the other tracks. It will just be brought down so that they all compete at a fair level. So if you push it to minus three LUFS, which is insanely loud, you don't get any advantage in streaming platforms. I also want to share with you that the LUFS reading is also not a perfect system. So sometimes I master music and it has like a little bit more relaxed LUFS reading, but when I listen to this, it's still much louder than some of the reference tracks that are pushed to insane LUFS um, levels, but they just still don't sound as loud. Which, by the way, is really nice because on streaming platforms, my master will sound better because um, they won't put it as much down compared to the other track. Good, but enough talking, let's now take a look and a listen at what this is actually doing. I'm going to start from a blank slate here. So I cleared this out using this function and we're going to look at what's happening here. Short term LUFS, this is what the music is doing right now in this specific section. So it will be very different in, let's say a breakdown section compared to a peak part slash drop. The integrated LUFS, this is an integrated value over the course of how long you're listening to this. So if I listen to the whole song, the integrated LUFS level will be a reflection of yeah, what this actually is. Good, let's uh, listen to this now. And by the way, here this is showing you the true peak of the material also. If this is like at plus two, plus three or something, then someone has not done a great job at mastering. But here it should be fine. <laughs> Okay, so here you can see this track is at minus 7.4 LUFS integrated. Pretty much the same because the music hasn't changed yet. If I now go to a different section, let's go here. Here you can see that the integrated level now changes because it's integrating the level that we have before with the one that we currently have, which is much lower. So even lower, even lower. So you get the idea. And then we'll go up again once it hits the drop. Now let's go to the other song. Clear this out. So it's a tiny bit more dynamic overall. So in the loud section of the other track, we were at like seven LUFS. Here we're around eight LUFS. And I think it's really interesting. This tells you that intentionally this track was also created with a little bit more dynamics, a little bit more headroom, um, but they're still kind of in the same ballpark. So both of them definitely loud enough to be played at festival, at clubs. So for electronic music, I would shoot for something between minus six and minus 10 uh, for most like dance oriented genres. I think it's totally fine. Um, you don't have to overthink that part, you just find out what is actually right sounding for your music. And if you're working with a professional mastering engineer, you can also discuss these things, obviously, and find out what the sweet spot for your specific loudness in your music is. If you compare your kind of DIY masters with something that's professionally mixed and mastered, sometimes it can be really discouraging because you don't reach the same loudness levels. I would not worry about this too much right now because in the streaming world, everything will be leveled out, normalized anyway. Um, but obviously you want to work towards this sweet spot of where your music is sounding the best and also the loudest possible. So without any trade-off. Trade-offs typically include something like too much distortion. If you throw it into a limiter too much, it's just sounding a little bit distorted or it starts to pump. So all these negative side effects are things that you want to avoid. And I would not make that trade-off of making, of making something like super loud just to have the same LUFS reading as the reference track, but then sacrificing some of the actual emotion of the music. And by the way, if you currently struggle with finishing tracks, with actually getting them to this point of talking about mixing and mastering and loudness and so on, I would highly encourage you to check out the free resource that I've created. It's called the Finisher Framework. It's my three simple steps to finishing at least one great sounding song per month. This is the goal that I have for you. And this framework is kind of a step-by-step -step guide of how you can get there. It helps you with things like skills, mindset, and also, of course, setting up a system that helps you almost automatically put out high quality music every single time. So it's much deeper than most of the other resources out there. It's still easy to consume. The link is in the description. Go to pickyourself.com slash framework. I would love to see you on the other side. So while I think that it's totally okay to use these free plugins and they do everything I need technically, I always ask myself, is there a better workflow that I can implement? Now, in terms of reference tracks, I actually use a different tool that I'm going to share with you in a minute. So let's throw this in, get rid of these here. 
The tool that I'm using is called uh, Metric AB. You can get it as part of the Plugin Alliance bundle if you want to. And the cool thing here is that it allows you to reference a lot of different tracks going back and forth between them. And also you have these different tabs here that tell you basically everything you need. I sometimes still use this together with a span analyzer, but yeah, I'm just going to quickly show you what that does. So let's load in the Sebastian Hoffman track here. So here it is. And now I can go back and forth between my track, which is the blue one, and Sebastian's track here. What's really cool is right now we have this in latch mode. Um, if it was, for example, the same song, but maybe the mixed version versus the mastered version, you can go here and click sync. And then it would sync exactly where my playhead is. So if I go here, for example, here this playhead also has now moved um, forward. This is really cool if you compare your unmixed versus your mixed thing, for example, or mastered versus unmastered. And you can even match the loudness. So this is super cool. You play the track now. And it will listen to both tracks and basically bring the reference track down in this case to be the same loudness as my track here. Now, obviously you have to choose a section where there is overall the same intensity. So I would not compare the breakdown of one track, for example, with the peak part of another track. This is something to watch out for, but overall this is really cool. You have frequency analysis, stereo image, dynamics, loudness. So all of these different departments basically give you all the information that you need. And I like to use the dual display, which gives you a direct comparison. So for example, let's go to, yeah, in terms of real life examples, let's go here. We use our peak part here from our track. Um, we go to the metric AB plugin. Let's go to the playback go back to latch and also select the peak part here. Now we can directly flip back and forth, for example, and compare the loudness in some really loud parts of both songs. So blue is always mine, orange is the other one. So I'm changing what I listen to, but still the displays obviously give us information about both. And as you can see, in the peak section, the Sebastian Hoffman track is mastered a little bit louder. It's like a tiny difference, but both of them are kind of in the same ballpark. So these are just like some of the features that I use the most in this plugin. I can highly recommend it. It usually goes on sale on Black Friday and also a couple of times throughout the year. If you can grab it for a decent price, I don't think that you can go wrong with this investment. Now, if you want to become better at using reference tracks, I would actually recommend you go through this exercise with five to 10 reference tracks by other artists and also some of your own productions. You go back and forth between them and you don't necessarily try to compare only your music to theirs, but you also analyze very different types of reference tracks by other artists. So for example, you pick some that are extremely edgy and like harsh sounding. Then you use some other ones that are really bass heavy and maybe more uh, atmospheric, melodic. So all of these different dimensions you kind of check out and you figure out how things are organized. And this will give you this look inside the matrix that I'm always talking about. So I have developed this over many years of mixing and mastering music professionally, but you can get there as well just by working with reference tracks and critically listening to the music of your favorite artists. Now, I would love to hear from you now. How are you using reference tracks? How are you working with them? What tools are you using? What methods are you using? And what from this video has made a difference for you? Leave a comment below. I read everything. I also engage with the people in my comments. You can see it in past videos. And yeah, I would love to see you in another video soon. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye bye.